Malaysia on right track towards economic development. And political leaders urged to stop playing with racial issue to gain votes. Good afternoon and salam Malaysia Madani. Welcome to Updates at Noon. I'm Brenda Lepal. Prime Minister Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim has urged the people of Negeri Sembilan to strengthen the state government and defend Datuk Sri Aminuddin Harun's status as the Menteri Besar by voting wisely during the state election on Saturday. The Prime Minister said by doing so, the state government and the federal government can work closely to solve problems faced by the people in the state. Kuat kerajaan ini Pertahankan Amin Nuri sebagai menteri besar Dan dengan cara ini Boleh kerjasama dengan kereta persekutuan Memudahkan lagi Masalah rakyat diselesaikan Datuk Sri Arwa was speaking during the Madani Unity Tour program for the Chua State Constituency in Kampung Pacitan last night. Datuk Sri Aminuddin, the Pakatan Harapan PH candidate for Sikamat, is challenged by Perikatan Nasional's PN Ahmad Raihan Muhammad Hilal and two other independent candidates, Bujang Abu and Muhammad Hafiz Baharudin, in the state election. Datuk Sri Arwa in his speech also clarified that his reason for choosing Datuk Sri Aminuddin as a candidate for the Port Dixon parliamentary constituency during the 15th general election was due to his credibility in leading the state. Meanwhile, at a separate event, Dr. Sri Anwar reiterated the government's commitment to eradicate hardcore poverty by the end of this year. The Prime Minister said all ministries and government agencies were working together towards this end. Malaysia ini bukan negara miskin. Minyak, gas, kelapa sawit, industri, Macam mana lagi di 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 negeri sembilan pun banyak. Tetapi kadang-kadang tak diagihkan begitu rupa. Yang dihebohkan kadang-kadang orang Sabah Sarawak bising ini sebab dia rasa pengagihan itu tidak adil. Sebab itu dalam belanjawan Madani yang pertama bulan lalu saya katakan tak ada pilihan. Kita kena bantu kena ni janji kita sebagai sebuah negara merdeka dan berdaulat. Keutamaan kita masalah kemiskinan. Sebab itu kita noktahkan kemiskinan tegak tahun ini juga. The Prime Minister said this during the Madani Unity Tour program at Stadium Tuanku Abdul Rahman's open parking area in Paroi last night. Meanwhile, in a Facebook post, Datuk Sri Anwar said the country is on the right track to move forward, especially in terms of economic development. The Prime Minister said he had highlighted this during the state election campaign at Paroi Stadium in Seremban yesterday, which was also attended by Unity Government Party leaders. He said various policy measures are being undertaken currently towards this purpose. According to Datu Sri Arwa, the power entrusted must be focused on the empowerment of rights and the economy of the people. In this regard, he called on all races to continue their support to the unity government in the interests of stability and its efforts to empower the people and the economy. The program was participated by thousands of supporters and also leaders from Barisan Nasional BN, Gabungan Parti Srawa GPS, Gabungan Rakyat Sabah GRS and Warisan. Actions by several political leaders that capitalize on racial issues to win votes in the upcoming state elections will leave a negative impact on the country's racial harmony. According to DAP Secretary General Anthony Locke, all parties should stop playing on racial sentiments to preserve the existing harmony. Hari ini yang duduk bersama-sama dalam negara kita ini masyarakat pembilang kaum. Bukan Melayu, bukan musuh kepada orang Melayu. Jadi janganlah kita bermusuhan antara satu sama lain. Saya yakin bahawa sepatutnya kita mesti mengangkat perpaduan ini. 
Anthony, who is also the transport minister, said this at the Charama Perdana PHBN in the Sungai Pele constituency in Sepang, Selangor. He added all races in Malaysia must reject any sense of racial politics and work together towards developing the country on to the next level. Malaysia hopes Denmark will take action against Danish anti-Islam and ultra-nationalist groups that stepped up their attacks on the Quran on Monday, despite widespread condemnation. Minister and the Prime Minister's Department of Religious Affairs, Dr. Dr. Mohammed Naim Mokhtar, also reiterated the government's stance, strongly condemning such actions. Explaining further, Dato Dr. Naim said Malaysia will continue efforts to explain the purity of Islam to the world. He said his office, together with the Department of Islamic Development Malaysia, Jakim, and Yayasan Dakwa Islam Malaysia, Yadim, have taken steps to respond to that through the publication of one million copies of the Quran to be distributed to the people around the world, including in Swedish and Danish. Uh, tindakan yang dilakukan di Denmark tersebut dan kita uh, seperti di Sweden kita mengharapkan agar tindakan yang sewajar inilah diambil kepada uh, pihak yang melakukan perbuatan apa tu terkutuk tersebut uh, menghina eh, kesucian kitab uh, suci umat Islam dan kita akan gunakan apa tu sumbangan 1.8 juta ini untuk syarikat-syarikat yang telah kita kenal pasti uh, untuk menerbitkan uh, Al-Quran dalam pelbagai bahasa yang kemudian kita kita akan agihkan. Jadi maknanya lagi Quran itu dibakar, lagi kita wujudkan dan kita serahkan uh, kepada masyarakat uh, di, di luar negara. The minister said this after the pre-launch of the 63rd International Al-Quran Recitation and Memorization Assembly in Kuala Lumpur. Foreign front, Indian Parliament debates no confidence motion in Modi government. Stay tuned. Welcome back. India's parliament debated a no-confidence motion against Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government yesterday, a day after opposition leader Rahul Gandhi returned to the House. The opposition Congress party launched a debate in a bid to force comment from Modi on months of deadly ethnic conflict in northeastern Manipur state, with a vote potentially to be held tomorrow. Government Minister Kiran Rijiju said the motion had been brought at an extremely bad time and Congress would regret it later. Modi's Hindu nationalist Bharatiya Janata Party, BJP, won 303 seats in the 543-member lower house in the 2019 election and is expected to comfortably defeat the no-confidence vote which it has dismissed as a headline-grabbing gimmick. Gandhi, the scion of India's premier political dynasty, was restored to parliament on Monday after the Supreme Court last week suspended his defamation conviction over comments criticising Modi. The 53-year-old Gandhi was sentenced to two years' imprisonment in March in a case that critics flagged as an effort to stifle political opposition in the world's largest democracy. Gandhi, a lawmaker from the southern state of Kerala, has not spoken in parliament since his return. His Congress party was once a dominant force but has lost the past two elections to Modi's BJP. 14 Sierra Leone soldiers, three current and former police officers and two civilians have been arrested and are under investigation for subversion while a ban hunt is underway for eight others. Last week, police said they had arrested several people who were planning violent attacks on the anniversary of fatal riots in August 2022 that left more than 30 dead. 
They said they were working to undermine the peace and tranquility of the state and planning to use peaceful protests scheduled for this week as a guise to unleash violent attacks against state institutions and peaceful citizens. Of the 14 arrested members of the armed forces, eight are ranked between lieutenant and major, while six are non-commissioned officers, ranking between private and sergeant. Sierra Leone Inspector General of Police William Faia Selu said a manhunt was underway for five more military personnel and three police officers. The Inspector General added that Sierra Leone had appealed to Interpol to help extradite any of the suspects found abroad. On 10 August last year, economic and political protests in the capital Freetown and other cities spiraled into deadly clashes, where 27 civilians and six police officers died in the incident. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan said the revival of a deal with Russia to allow Ukrainian grain exports brokered by Ankara and the UN will depend on Western countries which must keep their promises. Turkey was a key player in the now-collapsed deal that allowed for safe passage of Ukrainian grain shipments via the Black Sea. The accord, brokered by Ankara and the United Nations in July 2022, ended last month after Moscow refused to renew it. Last month, during a joint press conference with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, Erdogan announced that Putin would visit Turkey in August. But Moscow was annoyed when Zelensky returned from Istanbul with five top commanders from the Azov Regiment of Ukraine, who were supposed to have remained in Turkey until the end of the conflict under a prisoner exchange deal with Moscow. Turkey, a NATO member, has managed to maintain friendly ties with both Russia and Ukraine throughout the war. Ankara has shied away from Western sanctions imposed on Russia, but has supplied arms to Ukraine. Nigeria announced sanctions on organizations, groups and individuals identified as supporting the military junta in the crisis-ridden Niger Republic. Spokesperson for Nigerian President Bola Tinubu said the move was made in light of the pre-existing consensus of the West African leaders of the Niger impasse. The Nigerian president, who is also the current chairman of the authority of heads of state and government of the 15-member Economic Community of West African States, or ECOWAS, ordered the new sanctions through Nigeria's central bank aimed at groups and individuals involved in the coup in Niger. Last week, the regional bloc agreed to impose sanctions on Niger's military leaders involved in the recent coup. They said the military junta in Niger must cede power in a week and immediately release and reinstate the country's elected president, Mohamed Bazoum, or the ECOWAS, will take all necessary measures to restore constitutional order, including the use of force. The ECOWAS leaders also agreed to impose financial and travel restrictions on Niger's military leaders involved in the coup and establish a no-fly zone over the country. They decided to freeze Niger's assets in central and commercial banks of ECOWAS countries. Hundreds of firefighters on Tuesday battled a wildfire that has burned four days or for four days in southern Portugal, which, like neighboring Spain, is sweltering in a heat wave that has triggered widespread of weather alerts. The temperature rose to 46.4 degrees Celsius in Santarém, central Portugal, on Monday, a record for 2023. More than 1,000 firefighters backed by 10 water bomber planes were battling a blaze that has already burned thousands of hectares near Odemira, southwestern Portugal, not far from the tourist hub of the Algarve. Civil Protection Agency spokesman Vitor Vaz Pinto said nearly 10,000 hectares have been blackened since Saturday, adding that the blaze was still spreading on two fronts. Local media reported that one home as well as a rural tourist lodging had been destroyed, which had not yet been confirmed by authorities. Nearly 1,500 people, residents as well as tourists, have been evacuated from the area. A separate wildfire that has already destroyed around 7,000 hectares in Leiria, central Portugal, 
calmed somewhat overnight on Monday. Across the country, nearly 2,800 firefighters and 16 water bombers were in action on Tuesday. Norwegian emergency services evacuated hundreds of people in various locations on Tuesday, the second day that heavy rains caused landslides with the risk of more as a storm sweeps over the Nordics. A storm dubbed Han swept in over Norway, Denmark and Sweden over the weekend, leaving a path of destruction. Strong winds, intense rain and landslides hit parts of the Nordic region, knocking out power lines, flooding villages and bringing public transport to a standstill in the worst affected areas. Weather agencies in Sweden and Norway both issued alerts for severe flooding in several parts of their respective countries. The heavy rains also caused traffic disruptions with numerous roads closed and trains and ferries cancelled. On Monday, two wagons of a passenger train derailed in eastern Sweden after a railway embankment collapsed due to heavy rains, leaving three people injured. In the southwestern part of Sweden, fishmongers in Gothenburg found the market at the city's fishing harbour underwater after the Jota River flooded, in southern Norway, floods and landslides blocked roads and halted key train services. Eight South American countries agreed on Tuesday to launch an alliance to fight deforestation in the Amazon and stopping the world's biggest rainforest from reaching a point of no return. The two-day summit opened the same day. The European Union's Climate Observatory confirmed that July was the hottest month ever recorded on Earth. The closely watched summit of the Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization adopted what host country Brazil called a, quote, new and ambitious shared agenda to save that rainforest, a crucial buffer against climate change that experts warn is being pushed to the brink of collapse. The group's members, Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Guyana, Peru, Suriname and Venezuela signed a joint declaration in Belém at the mouth of the Amazon River, laying out a nearly 10,000-word roadmap to promote sustainable development and deforestation and fight the organized crime that fuels it. But the summit stopped short of environmentalists and indigenous groups' boldest demands, including for all member countries to adopt Brazil's pledge to end illegal deforestation by 2030 and Colombia's pledge to halt new oil exploration. NASA's Artemis 3 mission, set to return humans to the moon in 2025, might not involve a crew landing after all. NASA Associate Administrator for the Exploration Systems Development Mission Directorate, Jim Free, said certain key elements would have to be in place, notably the landing system that is being developed by SpaceX. Under the Artemis program, NASA is planning a series of missions of escalating complexity to return to the moon and build a sustained presence in order to develop and test technologies for an eventual journey to Mars. Free said NASA's officials had visited SpaceX's Starbase facility in Texas a few weeks ago to learn where they are with the hardware, trying to understand their schedule some more. Though he found the visit insightful, he said he remained concerned because they haven't launched and will need to do so multiple times before the rocket will be ready. He added that NASA will update the public in the near future once it has had time to digest the information gathered during the Starbase visit. On to sports, the Red Giants demolished KL City Fortress in Klang Valley, Derby. Stay with us. Dengan misi mesti menang, semangat perjuangan terus diledakkan dalam setiap pertembungan. 14 pasukan, satu sorakan. Liga Super 2023 bersama kami di RTM. Rakan penyiar MFL Liga Malaysia 2023. Kicking off our sports segment today, a goal in each half earned Selango a 2 0 win over their Klang Valley rivals KL City in a Super League match at the MBPJ Stadium in Kalana Jaya last night.
The Red Giants, who clearly dominated the first half, opened the scoring through Harith Haikal in the 32nd minute, with the latter capitalising on a poor clearance by goalkeeper Kevin Ray Mendoza. The City Boys' misery was compounded in the second half after Mukhairi Ajmal's shot from inside the penalty box deflected off defender Matko Zirdum into the net in the 76th minute. The result sees Slango remain in second place with 43 points behind the leaders JDT, while KL City are in seventh with 28 points. Meanwhile, Kedah Darul Aman KDA FC collected all three points by beating Sri Pahang FC 2-0 at the Darul Aman Stadium in Alo Star. The home team took the lead in the third minute through Nigerian import striker Ivadayo Olishegun, while K Partiban added the second four minutes before halftime. The scoreline remained until the final whistle. Elsewhere, Klantan United were humiliated at the Sultan Mohammed IV Stadium in Kota Baru after losing 4-1 to Tranganu FC in the East Coast derby last night. Both sides looked for an opener early on in the game, with several attempts going wide. However, a penalty was awarded to the visitors in the 27th minute following a handball fouled by Klantan United's defence. Ivan Mahmud then converted the spot kick to open the scoring line for the Turtles. The score remains the same until the end of the first half. Into the second half, the Turtles unleashed several attempts to extend their lead. It was not until the 72nd minute that Sonny Norde found the net to make it 2-0 for the Turtles. From that point on, Turnganu FC's Nick Muhammad Sharif Hasifi Muhammad Lazim added another for the visitors in the 84th minute. Klantan United's only goal came from Ismail Ikanade two minutes afterwards. Not long after, Hakimi Abdullah completed the route in the 90th minute. And moving on to the Women's World Cup campaign, a second-half goal by Catalina Usme fired Colombia to a 1-0 win over Jamaica and carried the South Americans to their first quarter-final. Now, the captain's 51st-minute strike sends Colombian fans into delirium at a packed Melbourne stadium and ensured the last American team in the tournament will battle England for a place in the last four. What had been a testy and physical clash up to halftime exploded into life after Usme's breakthrough, with both teams attacking furiously in a matchup of two of the tournament's underdogs. Jamaica's Reggae Girls had chances to level the match, but bowed out swinging in front of a crowd of 27,706, having reached the knockout phase for the first time in their second World Cup. Four years after Jamaica were eliminated from their group in France with three heavy defeats, coach Lone Donaldson was proud of the Caribbean's progress. His players competed while locked in a pay dispute with their national federation and had resorted to crowdfunding in the lead-up to help cover costs. In English football, Spanish manager Yulen Lopetegui has left Wolverhampton Wanderers after less than a year in charge following differences of opinion. Now, the Premier League club announced the coach departure on Tuesday, three days before the start of the new season. Neither party gave detailed reasons for the Spaniards' departure, but British media reported that the 56-year-old former Real Madrid and Sevilla coach was unhappy with the lack of investment in the squad. Lopetegui was named as head coach on a three-year deal in November when the West Midlands club were staring at relegation, and he oversaw a turnaround to pull them up to 13, sealing their top-flight status. The 56-year-old former goalkeeper had replaced caretaker manager Steve Davis, who was put in charge of of the team following Bruno Lage's dismissal in October. And Arsenal are closing in on a deal for Brentford goalkeeper David Raya with a transfer fee close to £30 million. Now, the fee was reportedly had been agreed between the two sides for Arsenal to secure the services of the Spanish international. Raya has made 161 appearances for the West London side since moving from Blackburn Rovers in 2019, as well as starting every Premier League match in the season, which saw the Bees finish ninth, their highest finish in the top flight since 1937-38. The 27-year-old was included as a backup goalkeeper in Spain's 2022 World Cup squad, as well as a squad which won the 2023 UEFA Nations League in June. 
In another transfer news, Edson Alvarez has reportedly travelled to London on Tuesday to complete a move to West Ham. This comes after various media sources announced the Hammers had agreed a £35 million fee with Ajax to acquire the services of the 25-year-old midfielder. Alvarez, a Mexican international who has represented his country at two World Cups, made 147 appearances for Ajax across four seasons. He is viewed as a replacement for Duckton Rice, who swapped East London for North London when he left West Ham to join Arsenal for the club record £105 million fee in July. Moving on to tennis, Alexander Zverev made a good start to his tournament with a 6-4, 7-6 victory over informed Dutchman Talon Crispol. The tournament's 13th seed and two-time ATP Finals champion will face unseeded Spaniard Alejandro Davidovic Fokina in his next match on Wednesday. Sverev relied on his serve, winning 71% of his second serve points and saving the only break point he faced to defeat the Washington finalists in one hour and 44 minutes. The German will take on Davidovic Fokina, who eased past American JJ Wolf, 6 love, 6 2. Sverev leads the pairs, Lexus ATP head to head, 3 love, and has not lost a set to Davidovic Fokina. Meanwhile, Alex Demenor's remarkable mid match search. Prove the difference on Tuesday at the National Bank Open presented by Rogers as the Australian upset 11 seed Cameron Norrie 7564 at the ATP Masters 1000 event in Toronto. The Minot won 7 of 8 games from 3 5 down in the first set to notch a 1 hour 43 minute triumph. In the first of those games, Norrie let slip a set point at 40 30 and then dropped serve with a double fault after repeatedly struggling with his ball toss in the strong Toronto win. The 24-year-old last week reached a championship match in Los Cabos and he will take on home wildcard Gabriel Diallo next as he looks to continue his strong recent form. Hasil perpaduan bersama. Inisiatif sudah bermula. Pembaikan dan pembaharuan dilaksana. Demi negara rakyat sejahtera. Ketika harapan masih menyala, bagi membina negara bangsa mandat rakyat paling utama atas nama Malaysia Jalan langsung Grandstand PRU Don ke-15 Sabtu 12 Ogos 2023 mulai 8 pagi TV1, saluran berita RTM dan RTM Play. Wrapping up updates at noon with a recap of our leading story today, Malaysia on right track towards economic development with various policies in place. Do join us again tonight at 8.30pm on TV1 and Saluran Berita RTM for more news. Till then, I'm Brendan Lepaul, Malaysia Madani, Tekad Perpaduan Penuhi Harapan. Have a good day.